Hey everybody, Marcus here. This is a video I wanted to make for a long time, but every time I attempted to make it, I found myself either veering too deep into metaphysics or not doing the subject matter justice. Another problem I experienced while attempting to script this video was incorrectly striking a balance between the subject matter and exposition as to the significance of what it entails. As such, I decided to put it aside until such a time as I felt that I had covered enough of the peripheral content in other videos as well as had developed my own skills in presentation to a higher level than it was a year ago when I had originally attempted the script. Now, the last consideration was in building up a rapport with my audience sufficiently to not come across as a loon when I finally put this video out. The subject matter of this video is focused around two very tightly related subjects, namely modern technology and modern science. Within MGTOW and in the online world in general, there is an undercurrent of science worship. Now, this can be observed in the fact that that and only that which is scientific can be considered knowledge. We find this in the language of almost all of the more established MGTOW channels, the atheist community, and online critics in general. The concept of a study pragmatically plays itself out as a synonym for truth. A study is also the de facto artifact considered as sufficient evidence for whatever proposition is put forward. The meme, citation needed, in many contexts is a call demanding the presentation of a study to justify a claim. Now, before I dive into the heart of this video, I want to talk generally about what I have observed and the obvious epistemological problems that are grossly taken for granted among those who have elevated modern science to this high position of epistemological privilege. Firstly, let us look at the concept of a study. For those who have been watching my channel for a while, you would have come to notice that I do not reference studies of any sort in my videos. Now, my most popular videos are those composed of handcrafted logical arguments which I build up systematically by putting forward straightforward premises such as all women are hedonistic by nature, and then building up my argument based on the consequences that must follow from such premises. Why I do not use science studies in my videos will become apparent as you watch this video. Now, let us dissect a study. A study has a hypothesis it attempts to either prove or disprove, or attempts to answer some sort of broader question. During the study, the researcher gathers a data set through empirical observation or a questionnaire based on a methodology he deems worthy. This data is then potentially put through some sort of statistical analysis that the researcher considers valid. Now, based on the result of the statistical analysis, the researcher, through the application of some logical inference, draws a conclusion. Finally, the study undergoes a peer review process during which other researchers in the field review that the methodology was used correctly, that the statistical methods selected were appropriate, and potentially, that the inferences drawn from the statistical analysis are correct. Now, this all sounds well and good. Well, it sounds quite scientific, does it not? After all this, our study is published and arrives in front of the eyes of readers around the world. Well, who are we in this cycle? Well, obviously, we are the readers. Now, let me ask you a question. Let us say that you encounter the following assertion. Women are smarter than men. Now, would you believe this statement if some random woman told you this, or would you more likely believe this statement if it was the conclusion of a study? Now, I would suspect that most people would fall into the second camp. They would more likely believe the statement to be true if it was the conclusion in a study. But why would you choose the conclusion of a study over the words of a random woman where epistemologically both sources of the assertion women are smarter than men have equal justificatory weight. After all, to you, the layman, both sources are testimony. Now let me clarify. I personally do not cite studies because I have not devoted any time into building up my understanding of all the assumptions built into any study. As such, I can never be justified in holding the conclusion of the study as a true belief. 
I have not spent time evaluating the methodology selected to gather the raw data. I have not reviewed the questionnaires if such things were used. I did not do the aggregation of the artifacts used to compose the raw data. I did not spend any time coming to understand statistics, statistical analysis, or the reasoning of why one method was selected over another. Finally, I did not verify the inferential integrity leading from the evaluation of the statistical result to the stated conclusion. In order for me to accept the conclusion of a study as a true belief, I would have to make the claim that I agree with every single methodology, decision, assumption, computation, and inference leading to the conclusion. Now, unless I verify every aspect of the study myself, which would entail I possess all the prerequisite knowledge to do so, I must take the conclusion of the study on faith, as testimony. As such, epistemologically, there is no difference in me accepting the belief women are smarter than men as a true belief, whether it comes as a statement from a random woman or is presented to me as a conclusion of a study. As such, anyone citing studies who has not gone through the intense effort to justify the conclusion of a study is taking those conclusions on testimony, on faith. But you must be throwing out two objections at this very moment. Firstly, you must be saying that the methods used by the researcher are clearly superior to the opinion of some random woman. And secondly, you must be saying that you do not need to do this research yourself as the peer review process would have verified all was done correctly. But here we are again. To the first point, you take on faith that the methods used by the research were superior and again that you agree with the methods, computations, statistical models, and so on. To the second point, peer review only helps those who reviewed the paper gain justification. It confirms to them, if indeed they do what I described, that they indeed agree with how the study was conducted and agree to all assumptions made throughout. It does not help you determine if you agree with all the choices made. In fact, to use peer review as a form of justification is to wrap testimony with two logical fallacies appeal to authority, and appeal to popularity, though the popularity would be contained to the peer review group as well as the researcher. In fact, as MGTOW, if you found a study saying that women are smarter than men, you would probably immediately assume that the study was conducted by a feminist, peer reviewed by feminists, and dismiss it outright, or at least immediately look for fault as you judge that such fault must exist. Yet here again, this rejection of a study is once again taken on faith. <laughs> now, at this point, I can imagine thoughts must be emerging in you of my unreasonableness as to the scientific project, or ideas of sensing bias within science. You may be thinking, I simply do not understand what modern science is. Maybe you think that I don't realize how methods in a study are designed to eliminate bias, and on and on. Now, the point of all I have said so far is to set the stage. It is not my point to argue of methods in modern science. It is not my point to throw any meaningful objections as to how modern science is conducted. My point is to draw attention to the epistemological considerations we must keep in mind. But here too, it is not the epistemological considerations as they pertain to artifacts produced by modern science, such as studies, that concerns me but the epistemological nature of modern science itself. Those that hold modern science as the only source of knowledge are hardly even aware of the implicit commitments they have made. They assert that the external world exists, which they cannot scientifically prove. They assert that the future will represent the past, which they cannot scientifically prove. And finally, they assume induction is valid which is impossible to prove as demonstrated by Hume. But beyond these typical philosophical criticisms of modern science, there is another one that is not spoken of. They assume that the modern scientific method, whatever that may be, is sufficient. Now, those who advocate the primacy of modern science like to bring up their openness to revision. However, not all revisions are up for grabs. Now, this may be a little confusing, so let me go into another story that I hope will be a little more revealing. 
When a study in modern science is conducted, it ultimately is concerned with the confirmation or denial of a fact. For example, the study that would have yielded the conclusion that women are smarter than men was looking to confirm that women are smarter than men is a fact that obtains. Now, let me clarify something about facts. Facts are neither true nor false. Facts exist or they do not exist. Only propositions pertaining to facts can be true or false. For example, if you see water falling from clouds, it would be a fact that it is raining. The water falling from the clouds is the fact. The proposition, it is raining, in turn, is true because the fact water is falling from clouds currently obtains. Now, what constitutes a fact? In other words, what makes one thing a fact and another thing not a fact? Well, on the surface, this is a trivial question. You could say, Marcus, a fact is something that exists, and its existence makes it a fact. In turn, that which does not exist cannot be a fact, and its lack of existence is what precludes it from being a fact. However, this is not at all what I am asking. I am asking what makes a fact a fact. You said that that which exists is a fact. Okay, then let me ask you this. What qualities constitute existence such that the thing you describe as a fact possesses those qualities? Well, perhaps this too is too confusing of a question. So let me clarify. Imagine you are walking around on a beach with a metal detector. When you pass the metal detector over a metal object buried in the sand, it starts beeping. Now, the reason the metal detector started beeping was because the object buried in the sand is metal. The quality of being metal is the quality that caused the object in the sand to set off the metal detector. Now, imagine you had an existence detector. What quality would set off the existence detector? Well, you could say something that is observable. But what makes something observable? Well, something that is mathematizable. Now, Please pay close attention because what I'm about to say is very important. When we say something is a scientific fact, a fact like gravity, a fact like the Higgs boson, we are saying a thing is mathematizable. What we have done is impose onto the meaning of the word fact, the quality of being mathematized. A scientific fact is something that has been mathematized. Modern science is the detector of mathematizable things and only mathematizable things. If a thing cannot be mathematized, it cannot be detected in modern science and therefore cannot be a scientific fact. But here's the kicker. Are all things that exist mathematizable? Remember, modern science can only detect things which are mathematizable. Therefore, if something exists that cannot be mathematized, it cannot be detected by modern science. Think about this very carefully. If something exists in reality but is not mathematizable, there will never be any scientific evidence of it. In language, such a thing would not be considered a fact as we use the word today. Now, let me ask you this. What would you accept as evidence of the existence of a thing if it was not possible to bring forward modern scientific evidence of it. Clearly, you cannot use modern science to investigate such things, so you would need to do something else. Now, at the beginning of the video, I said that I would talk about modern science and modern technology in this video. What I want to do at this stage of the game is make the distinction between science and modern science. Science is concerned with the study of what exists. Modern science is concerned with the study of what is mathematizable. This may not seem like a big difference, but it actually is substantial. However, it is not modern science that hijacked the concept of fact and imposed the quality of mathematization upon all of reality. No, that honor goes to modern technology. As such, modern technology precedes modern science. Modern science is a product of modern technology. Now, this should not be interpreted in some petty way, like saying that the telescope, you know, arguably modern technology, 
preceded modern science. No, it is not a sequence in time per se, but a sequence of thought. Modern technological thinking came before modern scientific thinking. In this way, modern science is technological. Now, let me clarify this. I will be presenting the content of Martin Heidegger's essay concerning technology for the remainder of the video. This essay is probably the most important philosophical treatise on technology written to date. In this essay, Heidegger asks the question of what is the essence of technology. Now, I will try to deconstruct this argument in an easy to understand manner, but if you want to get the full exposition, please look it up yourself. However, be warned, Heidegger is incredibly difficult to read. Let me read to you directly what Heidegger says the essence of technology is, and then I will dissect it to give you a better understanding. When we consider the essence of technology, then we experience in a framing as a destiny of revealing. In a framing is the gathering together that belongs to the setting upon which sets upon man and puts him in position to reveal the real, and the mode of ordering a standing reserve. As the one who is challenging forth in this way, man stands within the essential realm of an framing. Okay, it sounds like gibberish when you hear it for the first time. Let's see if we can make sense of it. When we normally think of technology, we usually think of objects like computers, smartphones, you know, the internet, and so on. We may also think of things like the wheel, spears, and knives. But the question is not to list the things we consider to be technology. We are asking, what is that one quality that all technological objects share? What is that without which technological objects would not be technological objects? For example, why are trees not technology? I mean, a spear is basically a short, sharpened tree, is it not? Well, to answer this, we need to go back to Aristotle's four causes. There is the material cause, namely, the stuff a thing is made of, the formal cause, namely, the shape and form it takes, the efficient cause, namely, that which brought it into being, and there's the final cause, namely, the function of the thing. Now, to give you the short answer, non-technological things have their efficient cause within themselves, namely, the acorn has the oak tree within itself already. Technological things, in turn, do not have the efficient cause within themselves. The efficient cause of technological things is man. In a very rough and dirty way, we can say that all that is technological is made by man. All that is not made by man is not technological. However, this is not a good enough account for Heidegger. Let us take the example of a cup. The material cause of a cup is wood. The formal cause is the shape of a cup. The final cause is to hold liquid. The efficient cause can be a man who carves cups, for example. But Heidegger goes on to say that the efficient cause is not really the guy who carves the cup. Well, sure, the guy who carves the cup is involved, but all he really does is bring together the material, formal, and final cause of the cup. Now... I'm not going to go through the complex metaphysical stuff in too much depth, but I want to tell you a short story instead to get the point why the cup carver is not really the efficient cause of the cup, even though he technically carved the cup. Think of the time when the iPhone was first developed. Now, technically, it was Steve Jobs who made the iPhone, or if you prefer, some team of engineers. But what about selfie culture? What about the countless shit photos people take with their iPhones? What about people walking around with their faces buried in their phones and never talking to anyone on public transport anymore? These are all things that were brought about with the introduction of smartphones. Did Steve Jobs create these things? Did he plan for this to happen? Or was he even aware this would happen? Well, clearly, he did not plan for these things to happen. You see, though Steve Jobs was an efficient cause of the iPhone to the extent that he put the material, formal, and final cause together, the iPhone is really the unleashed narcissism, antisocial behavior, loss of ability to read a map, and countless other things. These things, though considered consequences of the iPhone, 
were in the iPhone before it was ever physically brought into being. The iPhone merely revealed these things. It unconcealed them. So in this way, the efficient cause of the iPhone was all these consequences which Jobs had nothing to do with. Think of it another way. The reason any product is brought to market is because it fills some need. Well, the iPhone filled needs Steve Jobs could never have predicted. It was this concealed narcissism and laziness to read a map that makes the iPhone the iPhone. If narcissism and laziness did not exist in people, the iPhone would not be the iPhone. It would just be an expensive phone called iPhone. Now, technology is a mode of revealing, of bringing into being, of introducing meaning into not fully perceived things. It organizes what was before but was chaotic. It structures. It gives life, sense, reality to things. Selfie culture is not a listed feature of the iPhone, yet it is a feature of the iPhone. Look at a sports car. Is getting laid a feature of the sports car? Is personal freedom a feature of the sports car? Now these things are not factory installed, yet they are features of the sports car. But when Henry Ford started manufacturing cars, did he build sex appeal into it? No, but it was already part of the car, and all the car did through its existence is unconceal it. Now, there is a difference between technology and modern technology. Though both in essence are a form of unconcealing, modern technology is unconcealing of a specific kind. Namely, modern technology is an unconcealing of standing reserve. So, what is standing reserve? Well, think of coal. Coal is a compact source of energy that can be stored and later transformed into clothing, electronics, sex, and anything else you can imagine. Now, it may sound strange to think that coal can be transformed into sex, but the path is simple. Coal can be burned to generate electricity. Electricity can be sold to make money. Women will sleep with a guy who has a lot of money. Therefore, a man with a lot of coal can transform it into sex. Standing reserve can also be conceived as a storable form of energy, like a battery. Now, this is very significant. You see, old technology, like the wheel, never unconcealed standing reserve. It was not within its power of revealing. The essence of technology had not yet fully come into being revealed until modern technology. So, we now come to the link between modern technology and modern science. Earlier, I said that modern technology preceded modern science. Now we can explain why and how modern science became a consequence, itself a thing unconcealed by modern technology. Now, one common defense of modern science and the whole modern scientific process is that it just plain works. But how does it work? Well, it works by revealing standing reserve. Now, let me show you how this came about. Aristotle divided knowledge into four categories, Sophia, Episteme, Techne, and Phrenesis. Sophia and Episteme are concerned with those things which are necessary. Techne and Phrenesis are concerned with those things that can be otherwise. Now, let us discard Sophia and Phrenesis for the moment and only concern ourselves with Episteme and Techne. The Latin for Episteme is Scienci and the English is science. Techne, on the other hand, is where we get our English word technology from. What Heidegger argues is that techne, which is a form of knowledge on the side of things that can be otherwise, imposes itself on episteme, which is on the side of things that are necessary. What this means is that the domain of episteme, the domain of science, has a chunk carved out of it. A chunk of science is enframed. This enframed chunk becomes modern science. In this way, modern science is a subset of science. Modern science is not all of science. Now, we said that the essence of modern technology is the unconcealing of standing reserve. As such, the chunk that Techne carves out of episteme is the chunk concerned with unconcealing standing reserve. So modern science is concerned with unconcealing standing reserve.
But something can only be standing reserve if it can be manipulated. And the only thing that can be manipulated are those things which can be mathematized. So in this way, modern science becomes only concerned with that which can be mathematized. As such, over time, facts themselves become only those things that have being in terms of being mathematized. This is what Heidegger calls the challenging, forcing something out of nature. Nature is challenged to give up energy. Now, the pinnacle of unconcealing of standing reserve by modern science was Einstein's all too famous E equals mc squared equation. Now, this equation perfectly represents the boundary of concern of modern science, where everything ultimately is reduced to energy, standing reserve to be manipulated by man. Now, this is not to say that all of reality is in fact reducible to energy. It merely shows the disposition and bias of the modern scientific process when it comes to its perception of reality. Now, I hope you are getting the full impact of the consequences of this. The concept of a fact, our whole standard for objective evidence, of modern scientific evidence, is an imposition of the human will on nature to unconceal standing reserve. Our objective modern scientific facts are instrumental. We only consider a fact a fact because it is useful in revealing standing reserve. This means that the modern scientific project is fundamentally not concerned with truth or knowledge in itself, but only with truth or knowledge that leads to control. This also means that modern science is at its core not a scientific project any more so than banking is. Think of it this way. If modern science was a person and you were all of reality and became friends with modern science, modern science would only care about you only so far as you were useful to it. Modern science is like a woman in its relationship to reality. It gets to know reality only so far as it can get something out of reality and could not care less about reality's feelings, personality, or anything else there may be. It is completely blind to everything else and in its hubris asserts that because something cannot be seen through its own lens, it therefore does not exist. Meaning and purpose do not help to unconceal standing reserve, and so modern science has no interest in these things or tools to investigate them. It is not necessarily the case that existence is meaningless. It is the case that through the modern technological lens, which is the modern scientific project, these things are discarded. Now, those people who elevate modern science to the highest standard, too, view existence through the modern technological lens. Reality becomes meaningless, a set of mathematized sterile concepts where everything gets reinterpreted down to utility. Now, these sorts of people are fundamentally anti-intellectual because they reject and mock the investigation into reality that does not bend to the inframing of episteme that modern technology has imposed on people's minds. As Heidegger put it, modern science is a danger to science, and modern technology Modern technological thinking is a danger to humanity itself. Think of the concept of the human resource department of a corporation. Think of the term human resources and how dehumanized this very concept is. The danger of the modern technological disposition is that we do not stop at nature as the object we will un unconceal standing reserve from, but we will also look at people in this instrumental fashion. People become a means to an end and stop being an end in themselves. Human beings lose any semblance of inherent worth and so too concepts like human rights and human dignity become concepts with as much teeth as the concept of hell to the nominal theist. Well, sure, in conversation he will admit he believes in these things, but his actions do not reflect such a belief. Not only do I not cite studies in my videos because I do not spend time investigating the inner workings of the methodologies and statistical analysis used in modern science, but because I believe modern science is a waste of time for a philosopher. I am interested in science, the study of reality, not modern science, the unconcealing of standing reserve and its sterile, mathematized concepts devoid of meaning.
Being a scientist these days is like being a blind chromologist. You can know everything about color except what it looks like. You walk on the beach with your fact detector, but deny that the sand exists because the machine does not beep until you find something mathematizable. The transhumanist appears to be the highest rank one can achieve in modern technological thinking. For the transhumanist, man must be a means to an end, the raw material for the post-human condition. Yet the transhumanist finds himself in a paradox. Out of his love for man. He wishes to destroy humanity to make it better, to make it post-human. After all, it cannot be said that what one would become through the fanciful dreams of a transhumanist is anything human. No, that would be a failure, for man, in his eyes, is a failure. Yet hatred is merely the desire to see the object of hate cease to exist. So, out of his love for man, the transhumanist comes to hate man. His hatred for man extends to God, as man is made in the image of God. And clearly, if the image is flawed, so must be the template upon which it was built. Or do they hate God because God loves man while they themselves do not? Well, in either case, God, not being a mathematizable entity, therefore not an entity that can beep on the modern scientific existence detector, is swiftly dismissed. The transhumanist's hatred is satisfied. What I find particularly amusing about the disposition of the transhumanists and this whole cohort of advocates for modern science is their calm fanaticism, laden with the same promises they accuse religions of making to lure people to their fold, promises such as eternal life and a suffering-free future, eternity in paradise. The transhumanist has not vanquished God; he merely plays in a God cover band. Transhumanists have their own coming of Christ. In their language, it is called the singularity, the comet they are waiting for that will whisk them all away to their post-human potential. Theoretical physics, as done in cosmogony, impervious to empirical verification, provides a mathematized story of the origins of the universe. Yet, which theory is correct? <laughs> well, it matters little, as none of them can ever be tested. Math alone to Luther's sola scriptura. Of course, we cannot forget about the mathematical promise of the end times, secular eschatology in two flavors, hot or cold. And of course, there is no shortage of doomsday prophets such as Nick Bostrom. And like every other religion that has come before, this one too cannot stand any competition. But where modern science is rich in gizmos, it is impoverished in meaning and seems to be less concerned with truth. Than it is with control. Now Nietzsche saw these shortcomings in modernity and predicted quite accurately that modern science would become the religion of the masses. However, he saw it as a poor substitute due to its lack of meaning. Indeed, the lack of meaning in modern science is a very much a consequence of removing the human being from science itself. Descartes was instrumental in this move, and as we all know. Nietzsche did not take kindly to Descartes' version of the reinvented human being. Now, I want to close this video with one final note: modern science is great for learning how to control that which can be controlled within reality, but modern science should not be conflated with the search for truth or knowledge in general, but of a specialized kind of truth and knowledge. Modern science is insufficient as a pursuit of science in general. As a pursuit of episteme, to hold the belief that all that exists is mathematizable, that all that exists is material, is an unproven assertion that must be taken on blind faith. Many, unfortunately, do blindly assert this. Now, I find that those people that believe in a materialist ontology justify their belief by committing the argumentative fallacy of begging the question. They assert. That no scientific evidence exists of anything non-material, but presuppose materialism by asking for evidence generated by a method that can only detect material things. Now, in a similar manner, I could deny the existence of the smell of roses because I cannot detect it on a stethoscope. Now, it is easy to be skeptical of God. Skeptical of feminism, skeptical of anything non-scientific these days, because it is popular to do so. It makes little difference how poor your arguments are.
you will not experience any significant amount of ridicule. But it takes courage to be skeptical of the modern scientific process, for this is the heresy of our times. Yet, for those who are more concerned with truth, no matter where it leads, I encourage you to pick up philosophical works that pertain to science and discover for yourself how patched together with spit and duct tape the whole thing is. But for now, thanks for listening. Go team.